What's up everybody, I am Jesse, or Game Over Jesse, as all of you may know me here with us, as always, is Daniel. Hello, everybody! <laughs> Sorry. No, you're fine. Uh, Kayla. I timed that. And joining us for the first time is Joe, who I'm going to go ahead and let introduce himself for those who may not know who he is. Uh, hi there, guys. I am Joe Hernandez. Uh, I am probably most uh, well known for playing the role of Daruk and Yanobo in The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. Nice. All right, so for episode 41 of the Hylian Gamescast, you're going to be joining us for a brief interview and then a quick Q&A. Uh, we have some fan questions that we picked out that some funny, some serious, so hopefully we'll be able to get through a couple of them. But I guess the best way to start this out is with probably one of the questions you likely get asked the most. Okay. And that is how did you first like get this job, this role of Daruk in Breath of the Wild? How did it first come about for you? Uh, oh gosh, this was, if I had to guess, I'd say back in March of uh, 2016. And there was this audition that was floating around. And mind you, like for a big AAA title like this, and, and most like high profile type games, they don't, name the franchise of what you're auditioning for. They like to keep everything in secret so that, you know, spoilers and other important information doesn't get out. So it like it had this like very vague and generic code word and everything. And, you know, they they it was going out and they wanted like English, British, kind of standard American kind of uh, you know, actors that could pull off that dialect convincingly. So I was like, okay, well that's that's kind of within my wheelhouse, so I did it. And what was really unique about this particular audition is that most auditions that you get nowadays for, for us voice actors, I would say like 90, 95 percent of them you record from home. And so this was one of those like five percenters where they're like, no, we want you to come down to the studio and and record and like they'll you know they'll have the casting director there. Um, and to work with you. So I was like, okay, that's fine. You know, I, I really didn't think anything of it. I was like, okay, that's, that's cool. And you do it. And I read for a couple of different roles. And again, like the names weren't what they are now. And I, they, that was very intentional. Um, and they, like, everything was very vague, you know, like you had one character that was like, a rogue character you had a character that was a princess you had a character that was a warrior you had a character that you know was like kind of a barbarian and so it, it was very vague and so in my head uh, because like at one point uh we had signed like a non-disclosure agreement and it was very very you know was, you see nintendo up there at the top and so again you're you're searching for whatever information that you can kind of go off of and in my head, I'm thinking, okay, kind of Lord of the Rings-esque, you know, British dialect. Like, are they going, is this like a, maybe a new Fire Emblem game? I don't know. And so in the script, I'm looking, and there is no mention whatsoever of Hyrule, no mention of Zelda, no mention of Ganon, uh, Link, none of that. It was It was void of all that stuff. And I later found out that, that was done intentionally because they don't want people to know what it is that they're they're auditioning for. And so um, I, I auditioned for a couple of characters, but the one that I think that they obviously they ended up really liking was for this one character named Hannibal, and he would go on to become Daruk. But the and they don't give you any pictures. Sometimes they'll give you like an image or a screenshot or like a a rough sketch, and that'll help kind of form what you think the voice would be for a character like this again no image nothing to really go off of and so you go in with what your interpretation of this character might be and you have the luxury of having the casting director right there so you're kind of bouncing ideas off of one another and obviously like he kind of knows more and he's more in on the secret than than what he's letting on so you know you just kind of 
refine it and you're kind of bouncing ideas off one another. And, and that's sort of where it, it came from, you know, and in my head, you know, the direction that I was given was like Gimli from Lord of the Rings, a very big, bolsterous, larger than life character. So the picture that I had in my head was just this, you know, just badass warrior with this giant ax and, you know, just, you know, again, just very bombastic kind of a personality. Um, and then you do it and they call you back and you don't hear anything. And so it's like, okay, well maybe I didn't get it. And then probably about three months later, uh, I heard back from them and they said, yeah, you got the job. And again, no idea what was going on. They, they kept it very secretive, very close to the chest. Um, and even like the timetable from when we first auditioned to when we actually started recording, like I said, was like several, several, several months, which is a little unusual because usually like if you audition for something and you end up getting cast, you'll probably end up recording it within about a week or two or so. That's usually the timetable that thing, these things run. Little did I know that we were getting approval from all the corporate heads up at, at Nintendo and everybody kind of had to put in their two cents and sign off on, you know, what they thought the voices should be and, and everything. And so, you know, that's why things took as long as they did, um, which is totally fine. And I would say we probably started recording like day one, I would say probably like August or, or maybe uh, September of 2016. And the very first day I went in, the casting director, Jamie Mortolaro, comes up to me and says, it's Zelda. And I, you know, you just, your, your jaw drops and you just, you can't really comprehend what it is that's going on. I had heard whispers because, you know, you hear things, you know, uh, like Game Informer and, you know, little blogs on the internet that a new Zelda game was, was in development. But again, up until this point, we've never had voice acting in any of the Zelda games. So why would you think that, you know, you would be a part of this franchise? Like I had said before, I thought Fire Emblem, that's, that's you know, that's the route I thought we were going. So it, it really threw me for a loop in the best way possible. Um, and you kind of feel like, man, I, you know, did I win the, you kind of feel like you won the lotto a little bit. You know, I grew up playing the, the, you know, the franchise. I mean, I, you know, linked the past and, um, you know, Ocarina of Time and Wind Waker and Spirit Tracks and, you know, all those games I, I grew up playing as a kid. So to be able to, you know, just be a part of this franchise is just, it's mind blowing. I can't comprehend it. Um, Sorry, I hope that answered your question. I kind of no, that was bit, an yeah. amazing answer. Yeah, yeah, yeah that was great. Watching the live stream chat here, and people are talking about how just amazing your story is. And and there were days where we would record, and I would just go back to my car, and it was like, what just happened? So you know, and and the voice that I had with Daruk on day one was not the voice that he ended up with, you know, in the finished product because again you know, like most projects like this, you're constantly refining it. You're constantly perfecting it. Um, and, and really like, I didn't feel until the end of recording that I really got the character, that I really understood it, that I understood his cadence and, you know, and everything. And, um, for those of you that were able to be at the, the panel yesterday out in Salt Lake, or if anybody recorded it on, on YouTube, um, Bill Rogers was talking about his role as King Hyrule, where, you know, we just took so much time, you know, getting all those little nuances in his speech and his character. And, you know, you want to make sure he's he's strong, but he's not mean, that he's he's, you know, gentle, he's fatherly, but then he's not, you know, cruel or anything like that. So, you know, it's just this constant just streamlining and like i said refinement of this character and and that's a testament to jamie as a director and also uh to nintendo for giving us for allowing us the time to explore these characters uh to make them what they are 
because sometimes with, with video games, you know, especially when you're recording in the studio, time is money. So it's like, we just got to crank this out as quickly as possible. And so, you know, sometimes depending on the project or the company, there isn't as much care for voice acting as there probably should be, if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Earlier you mentioned that, you know, they came in and said, it's Zelda, told you that it was Zelda. So, uh, some people are aware of uh, the CDI Zelda games, but other than that and the animated series, The Legend of Zelda is known for being like basically text only on all of its cutscenes, on any dialogue. And the fan base, I feel, especially before Breath of the Wild, was very polarized, and half the fan base love the idea or would love the idea of voice acting in Zelda where the other half absolutely hates it because it goes against tradition and what they know Zelda as and if it comes out voice acting ends up being terrible then it might ruin that game for them even though they could just you know mute or change the language to something else and read the text because it's not like they're going to be taking the text out but that's just my little gripe <laughs> with that no, you're, but you're, you're absolutely right yeah, yeah. Uh, Nintendo, I think, is very aware of what everything you just said. Um, and if you look at, at most of their, you know, like first party games, they're, they're very careful and very protective about, you know, their characters and the dialogue and, and their voices and all that. Part of it is, I think, because they wanted to have a little bit more universal appeal. I've heard like voiceover casting directors, especially the video games, say, you know, we wanted to have as much of a broad appeal to as many different countries as possible. So, you know, to to have a very Western kind of dialogue about it, you know, um, might limit it its appeal. And then, you know, of course, there's localization and so on and so forth. And so you'll have, you know, for whichever you know country or market or whatever, they'll they'll do a specialized dialogue for it, so on and so forth. Um, but the reason why I tell you this is because you know at the convention when I was at yesterday, we had you know Chris Judge, God of War. We had. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Victoria Atkin from, you know, Assassin's Creed and Horizon Zero Dawn. And you look at those types of video games and you look at most of the big franchises and what they're going at, it's all very cinematic right now. You know, these are, are games that are being done with the same level of depth and dialogue as that of a big budget Hollywood film. And so Nintendo... I think is sort of testing the waters or at least they were with with breath of the wild where i don't think they wanted to necessarily dive into that pool just yet but this was them just sort of dipping their toes and seeing how people reacted to it and and i would say for the most part the the reaction and the reception has been very positive yeah so you, you kind of uh touched on the first half of the question but the the second half was going to be with it being uh, with the fan base being so polar opposite on should it have voice acting, should it not have voice acting, that's, I imagine, a lot more stressful for the voice actor as opposed to a brand new game that's coming out or a game that's always had voice acting. So coming in and being one of the main characters in a series that's over 30 years old, what was that like? For you, like, was it stressful thinking, what if the fan base doesn't like this? What if the voice acting's good, but then there's still the people who don't like the idea of voice acting? Uh, so what was that like for you, like, getting in the headspace, not just of your character Daruk, but in terms of the fan base as a whole? I tried to think of it not necessarily in terms of what would the fan base think. I tried to think of it in terms of what is what would me joe as a fan of this franchise think and that's that's usually like the you know what i i go in with uh leading into like a, a project like this because like i said i'm just as much of a fan of this franchise as as everybody else is and so i'm i guess what i'm trying to say is i'm probably my own harshest critic when it comes to something like this so, you know, there were times where it's like, you know what, we got to redo this again. You know, you just you constantly want to make sure that you are putting out the best effort. And and Nintendo and Jamie Mortellaro, like I said, the the, the director, um, I wouldn't say that 
we were getting a lot of pressure from them. I mean, obviously, they want to put their best foot forward and put the best product out there as possible. But I feel like, you know, I've talked with Sean Chiplock about this. I feel like the pressure that was put on us was probably put on us mostly by ourselves because we understand the gravity of what is going on. And so, like I said, we just want to deliver. We want to make sure that that it's the best version of itself that it can be. Kayla, Daniel, do either of you have uh, a question that you would like to ask? We'll kind of rot- um, rotate. I'll, like, I'll let Daniel here. go first. Real quick, oh, sure, to kind yeah. of build on oh, what yeah. you said. Uh, and again, I was reminded about it yesterday just because I saw uh, Jamie. Um, you have to trust. You have to have trust in your director. Um, mm-hmm. For a big project like this, it's a collaborative effort. You know, um, I, you kind of have to give him as much credit to, to my performance and to Elizabeth's performance and Patricia's performance, everybody else's performance. He deserves so much credit, you know, in addition to what, you know, what everybody, you know, sees our names and all that. And so, you know, a, a great director can can get a lot of nuances out of a performance. And that's exactly what he did. And, you know, there are times where, you know, like I said, you're, you're feeling the pressure and you're second guessing yourself. But right there across from you in the booth is, you know, a seasoned pro, a guy that's directed, you know, countless games, you know, Kane and Lynch just caused directed horizon zero Dawn. He's, he's, you know, he's, he's been there and he's done that. And so with that pedigree of his, his resume and his background, you have to trust and know that, you know, what he's doing is right. And, and so, you know, it's, 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 it's a team effort. It really is. Yeah, no, it's uh, it's uh, someone who I've done a bit in theater, not as much voice acting, but uh, you know, you make me kind of want to bring bring him on too because um, the director almost uh, often feels like the unsung hero uh, with performances like that. Um, you know, and they do so much pulling out of an actor. Um, which, unrelated to my question, but just some thoughts that I had when you mentioned that. Um, as far as Nick's question goes, I. Uh, I read in an interview with, I think it was Mr. Fubuyashi, um, or one of the other leader developers or directors of the game, uh, that they had made quite a bit of story changes as far as um, during development goes over the course of the years they were developing it, right? Um, so when it came to your recording, I know Patricia mentions, you know, it was spread out through quite a span of time. Was it like the first time you went in, you recorded a bit or the memories? Or did you have to go through like several different uh, spread out like over months apart performances uh, like to actually go in and record those bits? And then, you know, were there parts they recorded? And if you're allowed to answer this, of course, it's okay if you're not. (laughs) But were there parts where you went and recorded and then they just didn't even make in the game at all? Or you ended up having to go and redo because they just kept changing those scenes too much or anything like that? If you're Uh willing to share. Well, okay. I'll 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 say this. Um, the game I think was already at that point animated and voiced in Japanese, and so if if you guys are familiar with like anime and dubbing and and all that, um, the lip flaps were already animated uh, with respects to the cutscenes, mm-hmm. and so uh, that's something that they didn't necessarily tell me day one of recording. Had I known that, I probably would have worked on my dubbing skills a little bit more. Um, and so, like I said, you know, it's kind of a process and it's kind of, a you know, you you have an idea as far as like the syllables and the timing and the, the lip flaps and the movement and all that and the cadence and what's going on with the translation and all that stuff. And, you know, once you get into the booth, sometimes those things can change. And so it's not necessarily something that's, entirely set in stone things can kind of change a little bit um just depending on the circumstances and all that and you know uh, i don't think there was anything left out i really don't um you know and you do it and you you know you have so many different versions of a single line or so many versions of a, a single take and so on and so forth and so you know there's probably a whole lot of stuff you know probably lying around but um, I want to say that we used everything, you know, I don't think there was, there's not, there's not going to be like a deleted scene or anything like that, if that's what you're asking. 
Yeah, no, fair enough. Uh, yeah, that was kind of, I guess, the, the <laughs> correct term as far as that goes. Um, now, we, we, I mean, we talked a lot about Daruk, especially your audition for him. Um, Yonobo, as a character, is someone I find really interesting because he's supposed to be Daruk's descendant, but he's so wildly different of a character. Um, so when you went to audition, you, you mentioned you, you know, you auditioned for several characters. Was Yonobo one of those characters as well, mm -hmm. if, if they had that in the works at the time? Or was that something that kind of came after and they're like, oh, by the way, can you also do this guy too? He absolutely was. He was in the sides. And um, they were looking for a character that was very young, kind of like, you know, 17, 18, 19, you know, kind of young, you know, kind of nervous, kind of geeky, nerdy, you know, kind of in that vein. And so, you know, I, I tapped into what my interpretation of those sides were. Again, no clue, no idea that this would end up being a Goron. Had I known that, it, had I had had that that image in my head already, it may have um, may have altered what I had done in my approach. Actually, now that I think back on it, because it does work both ways. Because you know, you go in with your sort of preconceived notions, and you think Goron, you know, big, you know, big, burly, you know, kind of you know, heavy, larger than life, you know, very deep voices. And so, you know, if you have that that picture in your your mind already. Um, you certainly wouldn't come at it with uh, a sense of that kind of young, kind of, you know, pip squeaky, kind of cracking, you know, pinched voice that I ended up doing with Yonobo. So again, I was flying blind, so to speak, but you trust in, in what your, your director is, is doing with you and you run with it. You don't question it. You know, that's part of the thing about this, this field and voice acting is, you have to be fearless. You just have to go with it. And you don't, you shouldn't give it a second thought. Just go with whatever your gut instinct is. Uh, and I think it worked out. Yeah, absolutely. I think, um, you know, a lot of people forget about him a bit. I think he's not a character that's as well discussed as Daruk is, but I have a soft spot for, for Yonobo because <laughs> he almost feels like he has trouble sort of filling the shoes of Daruk, which is um, amusing in its own way because he's a big, and vulnerable character himself. Yeah, um, it's funny because you mentioned how I was just thinking um, how they didn't show you any pictures or images of the characters beforehand or at the auditions. And I was thinking about that, and it makes sense if they were being so secretive. Because if you saw this image and you're like, as a Zelda fan, especially, you'd know instantly. Oh, that's a Goron, and you'd I know <laughs> yeah. right away like what Ruto. you're working on and what you're dealing with. Or if I saw one, so yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so. Yeah, that's that's it makes sense. Uh, Kayla, did you have any questions? Um, I... actually, totally not Zelda related because I was going through your website earlier and just kind of like seeing what other stuff you were doing. Um, what exactly do you do with Disneyland Resorts? Because I see that you've been helping them out for like ten years now. That's crazy. Uh, it's been longer. I've been uh been doing character voices over at the park over at uh, Disneyland now for gosh, thirteen, fourteen years now. Uh, there's a little show called Turtle Talk with Crush. Oh, you, yep. And and uh, you talk with Crush the sea turtle from Finding Nemo. And uh, I've been doing that. And, and even when I first started, I, I was doing uh, the voice of Stitch over at uh, Interventions over in Tomorrowland. They have like a little picture phone where you can go in and talk with them. And this is like pre-Skype. So it was like really, really cool. And, you oh, know, wow. you're in like a little booth and you're talking to Stitch and he's like, you know, on a beach and he's, you know, scratching his butt and he's picking his nose and he says hi and all that. And you can have like, you know, a five, 10 minute conversation with him. It's very cool, very intimate. And um, yeah, it's just, it's been an awesome thing to do. I love, love what I do. One of the other things that a lot of people don't know is that um, we have a, a sort of a wireless remote setup for Turtle Talk with Crush where we're able to do shows remotely for the children's hospital of orange county uh twice a day oh that's awesome that's so cool awesome so all the kids yeah. that, that are there at the children's hospital that aren't able to come to disneyland and they do all sorts of really cool things for them you know trying to you know make them laugh and entertain them and you know do things for the parents while they're there um this is just one of those things that that you know is a great service to kind of take their minds off of what might be happening in their lives. So I, I don't feel like that gets enough attention and it probably should. 
Yeah, no, absolutely. I'd, I've never heard that before, so it's nice knowing that. All right, Jesse, do you have no. another question <laughs> left loaded? Uh, yeah, I was. Uh, I'm trying to time these right that way we don't go over with uh yeah Joe i know i'm kind of like taking yeah, a look to see when we <laughs> yeah. started when we can ask fan questions yeah oh we got a lot of momentum going so let's just keep you know <laughs> right. so um last oh i guess about two weeks ago it was the week after we got back from e3 we had patricia on and she mentioned some of the stuff that you were talking about earlier about how whenever she was doing the recording she had to match the words and the emotion and everything with the lip flaps because everything was already uh recorded in the other languages and all of the different localization teams were having to get everything to match so what was the biggest challenge with you trying to not just technically you know, get the words out to match perfectly with the video, but also doing that while getting the emotion that you need to come across as well. Because Daruk has a lot of, I would say he's one of, uh, for me at least, he's one of the more comedic characters. So what was that experience like with you? And did you personally, This I think this actually goes into one of the questions that one of the fans was asking later for the mailbag, but were you able to relate emotionally with your character as well? Whenever you looked at Daruk and his story throughout Breath of the Wild, did you, was that something that you connected with or was it something uh, that you had to actually uh, do a bit more acting with? Because sometimes, you know, if someone's like playing a character that's the exact opposite of them, then they have yeah. to... Uh, I don't want to say try a bit harder, but there's, uh, you know, a, a rift between them and their characters. So for you, uh, getting the emotion and everything with your character and the technical aspect of matching it up, how was that for you? And was the way that you viewed the character the way that it was uh, written on the paper, if that makes sense? It, it, it is an extreme juggling match because... You know, voice acting in its own is just just by itself is very, very difficult. You know, just like you said, trying to get the emotion and the timing and you're in this little booth and you want to make, you know, you want to honor the character and honor the text and honor the, the, the scenario and the circumstances of what's going on or the magnitude of such an epic story such as this. And you're acting opposite somebody that isn't there. And so you kind of have to fill in some of those gaps at times. Um, and so that in of its own is just, you know, demanding and you want to get it right. So now when you add in the, the, uh, the need to successfully dub and get the, the lip flaps, um, that's a really, really hard thing to do. Um, it's, it's so, you know, I, I, like I said, I wish I had known that, uh, that it was going to be a dub, so to speak. Uh, day one going in because I probably would have brushed up on my uh, my dubbing skills. I've done some uh, anime before in the past. Uh, I've been on uh, JoJo's Bizarre Adventure and um, Alo on the Sea. Um, gosh, I'm trying to think of other shows that I've done. Um, if you guys, I, and again, I don't know if this is necessarily the crowd, but if you guys are anime fans, you're anime fans, uh, I'm on, you can hear me on uh, season two of Berserk which uh, just came out, like, I think in the past you know, month or so. Joe, you need to stop. I'm Caleb fangirling lines. so hard right now. Who did you <laughs> voice in JoJo's? Like, like they, they told me, like, you know, hey, it's really gory. It's, um, it's really graphic. Like, you know, uh, it, you know it, it's not for the kids. And I'm like, okay, yeah, sure. No, that's fine. I can, I could totally do that. Like, yeah, whatever. And I go in and like in the first, like literal, like 10 seconds, there's like a guy getting like split in half and it's just, you know, everything is just so, you know, gory and out there on display and it's all in slow-mo. So like I said, that is definitely one that is not for the kids. So, Yeah. Um, sorry, I kind of lost track a little no, bit. No, no, it's, it's fine. Uh, people that are familiar with our podcast, we tend to get off topic <laughs> a lot. But that's what all of the, the fans that 
they like. They might tune in for the topics that we're supposed to be discussing, but they stay to listen to all of the nonsense that we get into. <laughs> and with you, uh, most of our questions are going to be Zelda related, but this is really nice for the people that are watching that may just know you as Daruk. So it'll help them if they're a fan of Daruk, then maybe they can go and check out some of these other things that you're in. Yeah. So this is uh, it kind of really came good. back you know, as far as like what to, you know what what were some of the challenges as far as tapping into a character like Daruk versus uh, Yonobo and all that. And um, I kind of gave it some thought, especially, you know, everything's still kind of coming back to me. It's, it's semi fresh in my mind, having had like sort of a mini cast reunion this past weekend, but I gave it some thought and I realized that Yonobo is sort of kind of who I was maybe back in high school, that sort of nerdy, awkward, unsure of himself type of a character. Um, you know, probably a very exaggerated version because I, you know, I'm not entirely 100, 100% like him, but I think when it comes to voicing any role, you want to tap into whatever qualities you can that you personally identify and that you personally bring to the table uh, with this character. And I would say that there are some definitely for Yonobo and, and definitely some for Daruk as well. Um, me being a new father, uh, there is definitely a loving and dad like quality to Daruk. Um, you know, and he, he's, you know, for as, as big and tough of his, you know, exterior and how mighty he is and, you know, all that, um, there's still like just this warm, lovable side to him. And, and again, you know, you just want to tap into what you can and, and bring the parts of your personality with the character. And, and sometimes, you know, it's real easy, you know, when, when it's, it's very well written, it just, it, it comes like second nature. Uh, I don't mean to skip Daniel and Kayla here, but while I have it in my head, so I don't forget it, uh, I have one serious question and then sort of a, a joking question that kind of just popped in my head which was so when you find out that you're playing Daruk and you're also playing uh, the other character Yonoba Yonoba so Yonobo. yeah Yonobo I have a hard time pronouncing it so um when you're playing Daruk and then like you know you, you get all excited about playing this Goron champion who is sort of taking on the role as sages would have in previous games where they're helping uh you know, going around saving the sages or saving the champion. So <clears throat> you get this character and you maybe fall in love with who it is and everything. And then you find out that he's dead and he's been dead for 100 years. What, what was that kind of like for you? And I think of that as kind of joking because in my head, I'm imagining like you get the script, you start learning about the character. You're like, oh, this, you know, this is really awesome. And then you turn the page and you're like, oh, he's dead. So, I don't know. Like, what was that like for you? Did that change uh, the way that you viewed the character at all? That you were... Most of the scenes with uh, the champions do take place in the past memory. So, w did that change anything for you? Um, a little bit. I mean, you know, even though he's quote-unquote dead, uh, Daruk is still very much alive. He's still a very lively character. Um, and so, like, you know, that, that doesn't really change all that much um i would say you know just from what i remember with respects to um the writing and the way it was written um he apologizes to link he's kind of sad you know he's like i'm you know i'm sorry i passed you know i i, I wish i could have done a better job and and you know i'm i'm there's a little bit of guilt i guess and he feels somewhat responsible for for calamity again and existing you know these 100 years later so there's a little bit of sadness um but through it all you know he's still the same character so uh, you know you you have to deal with the the seriousness of it all you know when you're when things are serious you got to be serious and when things are you know there's those little moments for the light-hearted you know fun i guess going back to you daniel this time Oh, great. Okay, so um, obviously when everything was said and done, the game was completed, it was released, huge, great reception. Um, then later down the line for the DLC, were they, did they have to call you back in for that? Or was that sort of, 
done ahead of time and then just worked into the DLC after. Because there's like additional scenes that if they hadn't planned on, you know, you would have had to go back and re-record, right? So I, I, I completely got you. Um, there are some mm-hmm. games where, yes, they will record the DLC sort of ahead of time, knowing that, you know, it's going to be coming like a month or two months afterwards. Um, this wasn't the case. Uh, you know, it, they had already announced DLC that was, was coming. I think even at launch, they had like the season pass. But it was never a guaranteed thing. And, you know, when we were recorded, they had never said, hey, this is the plan. That was never at all discussed with any of us. So I felt very lucky and very honored to be coming back and revisiting this character. And that being said, you know, even when the the Champions Ballad was announced, they didn't call us immediately. You know, they had announced it, but, you know, and so you're, you're happy, you're excited, but you're, you know... It, there was a little bit of time where, you know, my phone wasn't ringing. And uh, so you just, you know, you kind of go and then, oh, gosh, I'm trying to think of the timetable of when we recorded everything. I want to say it was like the summer of, of 2017. And it was released like what? Uh, that December? Uh, released yeah, the night that they had the, right. the Game Awards. I was That's I was right. at the video game awards with Patricia and Elizabeth, and that was a complete shock to to all three of us, because again you do it, and sometimes they tell you when it's coming out, and other times mm-hmm. they don't, and we're like, okay, you know, that's fine, that's cool, we know it's coming out eventually, but that was a complete shock, like I said, even to us, the cast. Mm-hmm. Yeah, was that a challenge, you think? Like, after all of that time where, you know, you had already finished recording, the game had been out, and then they announced DLC, so there was quite a bit of time between those recording sessions. Um, so was it kind of a challenge getting back into the character, or did you did you find it easy to kind of just slide back into the swing of things after all that it time was like riding. It was like riding a bike. You know, like I said, I, I didn't feel like I really got the character down until we finished you know, kind of like our, our last few sessions. And what Jamie talks about is, you know, that's kind of a constant thing with the, uh, exploration of a character like this on a project like this. And, and what he'll do very, you know, you know, for most of his, his games is okay. Now you understand the character. We're going to go back to the first scenes that we worked on day one and go back and kind of redo them because the, you know, the character grows, the character, it changes from, from, you know, what you begin recording with what you finished. And so, like I said, it wasn't until the very end where I felt like I got it and coming back and revisiting all these months later, you know, I, I still had it in me and I still felt it. And I still, you know, there are times where I was recording and I could just, I could hear Jamie's voice in the back of my head. And I just, I knew it, you know, we, we both carved out something that was great. And we just, we, we had it set. Nice, yeah, that's awesome. Right. Um, yeah, Kayla. I guess my my last question that I have would <laughs> be: um, How was it for you, like finding out that you were working with Nintendo and being able to work with them? Because, as Jesse mentioned, like we're both brand ambassadors, so um, I'm like I'm on the field, like I go out and I demo video games, and I get to go to the Nintendo of Canada, like head office all the time. And to me, that's like my childhood dream has come true and that's all I ever want in life. So I can't imagine like you like voice acting for a game for Nintendo. So like, how did you kind of like, how was working with Nintendo for you? It was really cool. Like, you know, they had brought down like some of their producers and some of their writers, like I said, when we were working on recording. And so, you know, you get a sense of, of who they are and what they're shooting for. And, you know, just being a gamer myself all these years growing up, um, you know, you have a, a, a pretty good sense of what their brand is, what their target audience is, you know, what they do and what they don't do. Um, uh, I, you know, again, at that con that I was at this past weekend, I saw Charles Martinet, who is the uh, voice of Mo- Super Mario. And that was a very surreal experience. And um, he is every bit as genuine of a human being and just a sweet person as you would think that that Mario would be or the voice of Mario should be. Mm-hmm. And we had a little bit of time to, to chat. And he, he told me, you know, 
in his career, he has stopped doing games that are violent or that have a lot of sex or, you know, a lot of graphic stuff just because it, it, he doesn't want it to kind of interfere with, with, you know, the perception or the image that, that he brings to his character of Mario. And, and to me, I, I admire the heck out of him for, for having that integrity and, and holding up, you know, the, the strong integrity of, of, of this character for this company. So I'm, I'm just happy to try and, you know, again, just keep it going as much as I possibly can and, and, do right by this franchise and do right by by Nintendo. Yeah, for sure. Thank you for answering that question, by the way, because you also answered my second question, which is about I saw that you actually met the voice actor for Mario, like <laughs> yes. on your Twitter. So I was going to ask about that, and then you answered it anyway. So <laughs> <laughs> again, I'm just I'm coming back from a convention, so it's uh, it's all very fresh in my mind. Yeah. You know. Nice. All right. Um, I guess my final question for the interview, and then we can move over to some of the. Uh the fan questions is and i'm going to try to ask this to everyone because i love hearing everyone's own individual thoughts on this uh when we had patricia on i asked her when we have some of the other champions on uh throughout the next month or so i hope to ask them as well but with uh breath of the wild ended with the dlc um so you got brought back to voice Daruk in the DLC. So um, if they, if Nintendo were to call you again to ask you to be on a new Zelda game, would you prefer it to be a Breath of the Wild 2? So in a similar way to what, like, what Majora's Mask was to Ocarina of Time or Phantom Hourglass to The Wind Waker to where it is a direct sequel, or would you prefer working on a brand new Zelda game with different iterations of Link and Zelda, maybe voice a completely new Goron or maybe an entirely new character, a Zora, Rito, a Hyland, the King, whoever it may be. Would What would you prefer? Because in one uh, situation you get to revisit one of the most uh, well-known characters from Breath of the Wild who you got to connect with, but in another situation you get to do something brand new. So, uh, where do you lie on that? What you would know, you that's, prefer? That's a really, really good question. And I think you can make an argument for a, a really good case for either one of them. If I had to say, I'd probably lean a little bit more towards... Uh, revisiting the Daru character, um, I've heard. I, you know, I've talked to a lot of people, you know, a lot of fans of the game, and they said, you know, we want to be able to play as Daru. We want to be able to play as Yonobo or you know, as uh, that's me. <laughs> you know, but but you know, I think there's still you know something. You know, they they definitely want more of it. So, you know, if there was a way to to do that. But that being said, man, oh, come on. I'll do anything, anything. I, you know, please, I, absolutely. I would love to come back and revisit this franchise, uh, whether it's as Daruk or you know, Bo or as something entirely different. I mean, I'm just, I'm lucky to be in the same playground as as everybody else. So, yeah. Sorry, I. No, no, <laughs> I, it's it's fine. Oh, that, it's kind of like a fifty fifty kind of a question. Uh, so I hope that's not a an entire cop out, but. Yeah. All right. Um, okay. So let's just say that it was, uh, they did ask you to come back. Like, hey, we loved your performance in Breath of the Wild. We're working on this next game. Um, what character or type of character would you like to play? Would you like to do another Goron in the next Zelda game? Or would you like to experiment with maybe a Zora or a Hylian? Or um, I guess another way to ask this. If we can make add a little bit more to this, uh, and is if you could voice any of the Gorons from the past Zelda games. 
So, man. like, there was uh, Darmani from Majora's Mask, who you get to sort of play as when Link puts on the mask. There's uh, the Sage from Ocarina of Time, whose name's escaping me right now, and I kind of feel bad for it. And then there's uh, all of the important Gorons from, like, Twilight Princess. There's the one that's, like, the archaeologist, I believe, from Skyward Sword. So, out of uh, the past characters, who's a Goron that you would like to play, and what is a new type of race that you would like to play in a in a new game? And I think that that ends it for me, unless Daniel has his own question. Um, so, I hope that's all right. You know, uh, again, kind of being a little nostalgic, uh, I'd like to maybe you know revisit uh, Ocarina of Time and and maybe play that that Oracle. Um, it's so weird. I remember being like thirteen years old. And playing on my N sixty four, and going, yeah. and I can still, I can still remember the music, and going and visiting there, and I was just, I was so drawn to the Gorons, and I had no clue whatsoever. I not even not in my wildest dreams could I have ever imagined, you know, that little thirteen year old boy playing Ocarina of Time would be voicing a Goron. All these years later, and believe me, it's it's insane. It, it I cannot comprehend it even to this day. Yeah. Um, in the so for me, in the chat, they're was, correcting me. It was Darunia was his name. Oh, okay. Wow, you guys are on the ball. <laughs> but yeah, that would be very cool. Just just you know, for my own nostalgia. Uh, that ends it for me, uh, Daniel. Yeah. Do you have any final questions before we move on to the Zelda mailbag? No, no, no other questions spring to mind. I'm just just excited this is happening right now. So. I know, me too. We have no right. idea. Um, yeah. All right. Yeah. So if you have maybe 10 more minutes or so, Joe, we can move on to the, the mailbag. These are all questions from the fans. Are there a lot of people listening right now, watching right now? Uh, there's 39 people watching right now, wow. and I'm not sure how many there are on Twitch. There's probably around half that on twitch so not too many people but when... well thank you for everybody that's that's listening right now that's doing it live i know we had a slight shift in the the time so thank you everybody for sort of rolling with the punches yeah all right so i'm going to do a new intro for the zelda mailbag because when we upload these on youtube the interview will be its own segment and the the mailbag will be its own segment is uh typically how we do the podcast um before yeah. that, quick thought, I was yeah. actually just scrolling through the Zelda mailbag, and I feel like Joe has already answered a lot of these oh, questions, really? so it true. might we be really short. Some of them. All right. But... <laughs> yeah. 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 If we, you we guys can... have other questions, or if anybody on the Twitch stream or anything like that, if you just, you know, come on, just throw it at me. Yeah, everybody that's, yeah. Everybody that's watching live, uh, you know, just put up your question. Be sure to tag myself or Kayla or Daniel mm -hmm. so we can be sure to see it. And then after we get through these questions that he hasn't already answered, we'll pick those. But we're going to get started with the uh, the mailbag. So everyone's ready, I imagine? Yep. Yeah, all right. 